Namaste. It's wonderful to be on the panel with such dynamic uh, world leaders. So here I would like to begin with Gurudev's quote. Gurudev often says, a strong mind can carry a weak body, but even a strong body cannot carry a weak mind. A strong mind is a wealth for all time. Whichever time you know we are in, facing now, we do have, the, whenever stress surmounts, I would say, amid storms of emotions, a strong mind is what that can help you cross over. But how can we have the strength of mind? You cannot learn archery standing in the battlefield, Yuddha Kale Shastra Abhyas, they say. So we cannot do that. So a strong mind needs to be nurtured through, a, through certain disciplines. So when you're happy, you feel strong. When you have clarity in the mind, you feel strong. When the mind is relaxed, it gains strength. So, however, the tendency of the mind is to oscillate between past and future, you know. It is uh, glorifying the past or uh, dreaming about a wonderful future, or it is anxious about the future and angry about the past. So, it is not possible to relax in the past or future. So, the first thing is the skill to bring the mind to the present moment. Uh, is the art of letting go, that we call it meditation. And this is what happens when we meditate. While circumstances, um, cultures, technologies, languages, etc. have changed, the nature of the human mind is still the same. And meditation is a time-tested universal solution. The ancient seers uh, practiced it and it works so effectively even for today's uh, you know, world. So meditation relaxes the mind, as we all know, and brings clarity. Uh, it, uh, as you continue to practice, your mind becomes stronger and stronger. Harnessing the power of the mind has been a part of the human quest from time immemorial. And the practical way to attain it is through meditation. This has happened to thousands of people all around the world. Gurudev has been teaching. He has taught so many of us to meditate and uh, gain that mental strength. In this time, it is so necessary to have this strength, mental hygiene. Meditation is that mental hygiene which is so necessary. That is the health, to maintain the health of the mind. So when you meditate, there is concentration, there is clarity of perception, and keen observation happens, refineness, refinement in communication happens. And beyond all this, uh, our presence speaks volumes, you know, there is a positive presence. When you meditate, there is so much of positivity in us that we can share with others. What we have only we can share, isn't it? When we are happy, when we are uh, relaxed, we can share all that. If you are tense, stressed, the same thing we uh, uh, share with others. So that is why meditation is a definite uh, way to uh, cleanse our presence and then create a beautiful mind. You know, by when individual only makes society, isn't it? So when individual is happy, blossomed in peace and uh, happiness, they can create a society full of uh, peaceful people and then the, and so on and so forth with the world also. It is uh, from individual to universal consciousness spreading that peace and um, happiness. That is what happens when you are calm and collected and when you have a serene mind and a happy mind. So happiness is an attitude which you can cultivate. It is, that is where even meditation helps you in um, attaining this because meditation helps you to go to the source of your uh, strength, that source of inspiration. Uh, it takes you and you can be in that inner space and that climate, inner change, climate change, Vandana knows. <laughs> so that inside, as we, purif we, we have that purity, we uh, reach to that. So to, through meditation, we can gain the clarity of mind, purity of our heart, as Gurudev says. And, and so sincerity in action happens through us. So this, in addition to this meditation and spiritual practices, there are few other factors that influence uh, mind, you know, to be strong. So they are like the food that we eat. It's very, very important to have healthy food habits, as we all know. 
and exercise here, pra pranayama, and then also yoga is play, plays such an important role. And also the company we keep. I would say a fit body and a pleasant mind is a great combination. So when there is more positivity, uh, there is great happiness as we all know. So we can only share what we have, as I said before. So when, when we have happiness, we can spread happiness. Today, let us all resolve, you know, that just this is really right time because there's so much of uh, darkness. And as Gurudev said, there is a silver lining uh, when such great thinkers like all of, all, all of you here, great leaders, have come together to find solutions for such calamities. Of course, we have faced with so many uh, natural calamities even before we have moved on, we have, you know, we have really sailed through. Even now, this also, definitely we can uh, combat this, but unitedly we have to stand and then we have to find that peace that we have, we are, and we can give that peace that we, we have within us. Through meditation, it is definitely, I feel it is a great, you know, it is a solution, I would say, for men, when the mind is calm, it can think better, it can find better solutions. And having a strong mind is not a luxury definitely anymore. It is a necessity. Before they used to say, oh, meditation is a luxury. You now after I retire, I will do it. But it's not so. It is definitely a necessity now need of the hour. So here it's very interesting, you know, there are several studies, scientific studies uh, that have established the benefits of meditation for the individuals. Like it, you know, it protects the DNA from degrading as we age. So many people uh, observe this. Uh, meditators look ageless. <laughs> and they look young. Um, they are young at heart. And, and also, you know, definitely there is a presence in them. At the same time, it is meditation. It brings greater coherence between the right and left brain uh, hemisphere, you know, that active brain activity. Our brain at left and right hemisphere, right is for creativity and left is for analysis. So meditation helps to bring uh, that balance, you know, in, with the, both the hemisphere. So then uh, it activates the vagus nerves, which is responsible for good health. In fact, it's a very interesting study about the vagus nerve they have uh, done. At the same time, it calms the amygdala, which controls the emotional quotient in us, and also improves the hippocampus, uh, resulting in better memory. We all need this. <laughs> good memory, in fact, you know. So these are the benefits among so many other benefits. These are the scientific uh, uh, findings that uh, they say about meditation and which is very essential. If you see, we are now combating between aggression and depression because of uh, all the um, incidences and the, uh, and the uncertainties that we are facing in the world today due to this pandemic. There's so much of aggression or depression is happening. So to uh, really overcome this, we need to have a calm and uh, collected mind, you know, quiet. Uh, how to do this is through meditation. Meditation takes you to that space within you to uh, remind you that you are the source of energy, you have that strength within you, and you can uh, go through this also. We can argue we are so busy in doing so many things, where is the time for us? But definitely, you know, intelligent people only turn to, uh, they want to keep their mind under, under their control. Otherwise, mind really, you know, takes you under its control. So it is very necessary for us to have this and also be assertive and effective, to be assertive and also effective. And without aggressivity, is, this is very essential, to have a calm and uh, you know, a peaceful mind and a beautiful mind which can share with others. So this, uh, this can happen when you learn the art of letting go, that is meditation. So they say there is a very beautiful adage in uh, Sanskrit which says, Mane eva manushyanam karanam bandha mokshayoho. Means the mind is the one which can bind you 
you know, it creates bondage or it can uh, give you freedom. So as human beings, we really love to be free, isn't it? We have free spirit, they say. So that is where it is so essential to train the mind to listen to us. And meditation helps us to have this ability uh, to train the mind and make the mind more positive. So then it is like Gurudev said, when we violate the laws of nature, we are, you know, faced with such difficulties. That is what has happened to us today. We need to create this beautiful mindset that we have to take care of this planet Earth. And uh, Vandana Ji will tell us more about this, how we can really nurture our planet in a better way and how, because she has been nurturing us. The planet is the one who is has really taken care of us and we have to necessarily look into this environment and I am talking about the inner environment, <laughs> that also we have to take, isn't it? We have to um, take care of our own self, so from individual to the universal spirit, that is what meditation helps us to be in that space. And uh, there are so many more things I want to share with you, but, and, but this is, uh, I want to listen to all of you also, I know a positive of time. So it is so nice uh, that we have all come together. This uh, conference has given us an insight, beautiful insight, and we have come here to sow the seeds of positivity for positive uh, transformation, social transformation, whatever in, in a healthy society. We want to live a healthy and happy, um, much cleaner society for our future generations. So I would once again say, I would li like to say that the panacea, the elixir of life is meditation. That is my conclusion. <laughs> that how we need to meditate, <laughs> we need, that is the main answer for us. You know, when our mind is happy, it can cre create more people around us happy and when it is relaxed, it can be more, uh, stronger, powerful and creative, useful, effective also. Uh, with that, I would like to thank all of you for joining this beautiful, uh, wonderful conference. Once again, uh, Chinki Sen, you can, yes, floor you, is Didi. yours. Thank you, Didi. That was really wonderful how you uh, highlighted the fact that the meditation, spiritual practices, the art of letting go, um, how happiness is an attitude that we can uh, really uh, practice it. And uh, in this time, uh, especially if we can maintain a strong mind, then it can help us deal with all the challenges. And that is what you have expressed uh, so clearly that meditation and spiritual practices can make our mind strong, can make us more confident and able to take care of all these matters that come before us. Thank you so much, Didi. It is now my privilege and honor to uh, um, uh, invite the Honorable Vice Prime Minister of Mauritius, Mrs. Leela Devi Dukun Luchuman to share with us. Uh, Leela Devi is focused on women empowerment, on, uh, a, a gen, um, on climate change, as well as quality education. That is her focus. And Leela Devi, we look forward to hearing from you. Namaskar. Anumati Ji, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let me start by extending my deep appreciation to the Board of Directors of the World Forum for Ethics and Business for inviting me as a speaker in this virtual conference on the occasion of the World Health Day. Obviously, the theme for 2021 couldn't have been more appropriate building a fairer, healthier world is a theme that is powerfully consonant with the context in which we are living. The sanitary crisis we are today experiencing has only sharpened the global reality of growing inequity in so many domains, including that of education. We need more equity in a much healthier world. Emphasis on providing access to education has always been motivated by the best of intentions, especially that of improving lifestyles and livelihoods. However, 
sadly, over the decades, the very purpose of education had been almost exclusively skewed in favor of economic responsibility. The economic responsibilities education had to fulfill. And that has been a global scenario. Whether as a small agricultural economy in the early years of independence, or as an active participant in the Industrial Revolution, or again, the subsequent shift to service sector, services sector, education has always been seen as cardinal to the development of human capital in the Republic of Mauritius. Not so much the human entity, but the human seen as a resource. One could easily vouch for the success of this mission. Broadly education systems should be encouraging students to be creative innovators, thinkers, ethical leaders to keep pace with the changes happening in our several societies. This is a type of education system we need today. We need schools where students are not merely trained to follow rules and orders, but to be self-motivated. We need schools where students question what is going on in the world and to the things the right way. We need learning organizations that not only prepare students for employability, but also inculcate a sense of personal and social responsibility. After all, non-cognitive factors are absolutely important for a successful and well-balanced life. This be loud enough to ascertain that a value-based education is what precisely all education systems need to highlight. This is especially valid since young people are more prone to losing their bearings and are more vulnerable to social ills. We're living in a world characterized by rapid change and the inroad of several influences is often nefarious for the psyche of the child. Nothing could be more adverse than having children not prepared, not strong enough to face the change. Ladies and gentlemen, let me labor the point further. I'll be saying nothing new by arguing that today we can no longer merely keep a narrow focus on high marks, road learning, and standardized testing. These hardly prepare learners to confront the ills of society, most current and those in the pipeline. Educators today will have to shape the character of students more and will have to focus on this more than on completing the syllabus. And this explains why our Maur Mauritian education system has shifted towards giving the holistic development of learners is prominent place in the curriculum. And I insist on the term shifting back because in the earlier days, this was the case. It is today generally understood that holistic student development encompasses both academic learning and the development of skills such as problem solving, analysis, simultaneously has become important to recognize all the aspects of learners as individuals who are growing and maturing affectively and morally. The social emotional development of children becomes imperative. Our national curriculum framework has been reviewed and redefined to include subjects and topics aimed at balancing physical, intellectual, emotional and spiritual aspects of every learner. International good practice has demonstrated that this will eventually help our learners to become resilient and increase their ability to think, act and cope with the challenges that arise. If nothing else, the COVID-19 pandemic has given us ample evidence of the paramount importance our resilience. 
excellencies, colleagues, let me repeat that an emphasis on values and the overall multidimensional development of learners has become critical in a world where moral crisis and ethical deficits are on the rise. The mental health, the well-being of our youth is at risk with the inroads made by social media, with the unfortunate culture of fake news, cyberbullying, formal fear of missing out, and the like. And now with COVID-19 causing schools to be shuttered in many countries, the mental strain of our learners has, has spiked. Let us face it, students go through a lot during times of school closure. All surveys carried out internationally on the impact of COVID-19 clearly show that during the pandemic, learners have experienced increased anxiety. They also internalize the stress and trauma experienced by parents that are passed on to them. Also, we have noted during the same period, the rise in domestic conflicts and violence, which cause further mental stress to the young learners. It is obvious that such children will miss the care, the empathy, and the social wellness schools formerly offer. In short, the social experience so important is on growth. The learning space here may be severed, may be rule-based, but it makes for talking, playing, and working together. Inevitably, physical isolation from peers and social deprivation can have a dramatic impact on students. And that impact is especially felt on their overall development, including their social emotional one. On the other hand, students also go through a lot during the times when school reopened their doors. First, with gradual reopening in many countries, one must understand that facilitating the sanitary re-entry into schools for learners is only half the story. We have the, we have the responsibility for education, have to grapple with so many more issues pertaining to mental health. So let us face it, emotionally, it is going to be a long climb out of the effects of the pandemic for many learners. But I have absolutely no doubt that getting out of the pandemic front will be a reality. But there is a price, an emotional price that will have to be paid. There will be medium and long-term impact on the emotional and social well-being of our students. It is here that I would wish to situate the role that women are called upon to play in such simple and constrained times. Yes, the pandemic has increased a degree of uncertainties, especially economic uncertainties. Many households have to rely on limited incomes and savings and even no income for others. Loss of jobs has become common, a common unfortunate reality. This situation has led to increasing demands on government subsidy, which in itself is a severe strain on welfare services, which few governments can sustain. And yet, paradoxically, the pandemic has offered a swathe of opportunities. And one central one is to acknowledge the crucial role women play in our society. In, country, in countries like ours, the national lockdown has highlighted, heightened the recognition of the often invisible role that most women play to home, taking care of the household, taking care of the children, the elderly, and side by side, virtually completing their office tasks. On the other hand, the lockdowns and quarantine measures in Mauritius and across the world have increased women's workload as more people are homebound for a continued period of time and caregiving tasks have increased. Still, entrepreneurship among women has thrived and as has thrived what in French is called la débrouillardise, their resourcefulness, their sense of initiative taking. So yes, women have clearly demonstrated the capacity to have a strong mind, and that is a panacea. What will stand them in good 
seen as we start to enter into the post COVID world. Again, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we can see the positive element associated with women in the education sector. In many parts of the world, there is a strong tendency towards the feminization of the teaching profession. I, for one, am indeed pleased that it should be. Women, and the more so, lady teachers are, I believe, so DNA'd as to best help inculcate a genuine value-based education in children and in our growing minds. This nexus between value-based education and women has always been the X factor in societal development. It is this training that supports young learners to face the outer world with the right attitude and values. Without a value-based education, all forms of development are likely to be jeopardized whether it is character development, personality development, citizenship development, or again, spiritual development. I'll go to the extent of saying that this is the fountain head of positivism in life. It gives a positive direction to students to help shape their future and even to understand the purpose of their lives as well as their perspective on life. Often, this positivism is transmitted to the younger generation implicitly by observing the mother or the teacher. Their style and values are passed on and internal, internalized subconsciously by the young learner. Excellencies, having said that, let me be the devil's advocate. Let me take up what I view as one crucial issue here. The kind of holistic education we have been talking about has undebatably its significance for all learners in all systems. However, it's also a fact that we must recognize the competing priorities faced by many countries. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic was declared, many countries could not provide school access to numerous school age children. In fact, Statistics show that 258 million children were out of primary and secondary schools, while more than 175 million children were not even enrolled in pre-primary education. All evidence points out to the fact that COVID-19 will dramatically further exacerbate the whole issue. In this context, it becomes highly contentious to determine what these countries have to prioritize. Should they, for instance, prioritize digital-based learning and the heavy funding this requires in lieu of investing on foundational learning? Excellencies, we know that this that it will be very hard for some countries at this particular conjuncture place a high premium on value-based education, but we have to start somewhere. Some countries go by defining a happiness index. Others in insist on the fact that schools are no, are no longer more to be judged merely on the academic performance of, of learners, but on the well-being of learners. And this is what matters most. Nonetheless, I believe that it is a crucial responsibility for all education systems to ensure the inculcation of sound values for the moral pickup in society. Let me conclude by bringing back to the center of the table what Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states. Education shall be directed to, full, to the full development of the human personality, unquote. I strongly believe that one fundamental challenge facing our education systems today is to develop the psychosocial competence, personal skills, to help learners make careful decisions, communicate effectively, develop coping skills with the environment. Besides the COVID-19 pandemic, the fast moving global conditions prevailing today require individuals to mold themselves into becoming resilient. However, before we can speak of building mental resilience in our learner, there are some universal concerns that need to be addressed and address globally. Firstly, how effective are our programs 
at inculcating civic mindedness and social responsibility in our learners? How effectively can we facilitate them moving away from self-centeredness, their shunning the temptation of placing self-interest above the community interest? There are card these are cardinal to the growth of the social consciousness. Two, how do we overcome the impacts often devastating occasioned by school closures on our learners? Three, how do we increase the capital positivity in our students as well as in our educators and slash the negativity that today's challenging conditions seem to encourage? I believe part of the answer is to fall back on what we encourage in education and what should in fact be a way of life in the new normal, namely network and connecting with our fellow beings and demonstrating greater empathy with and for them. And we need this bonding, this exposure to new perspectives for a genuine resilience that is collective in nature. Happiness and wellness need to be redefined as qualities that would form the bedrock of citizenship in a context that demands collective solidarity for the world. I thank you and over to you, Madam Facilitator. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Vice Prime Minister. That was wonderful. And uh, what, really, uh, what really resonated was the fact that you said shifting back going back to systems that have been age old and have worked before going back to our traditional ways of learning and uh, teaching and education that can inculcate a strong mind in our younger generation. That was wonderful. And also you talked about connecting, networking, bonding and teaching children, uh, you know, a holistic values-based education. That is uh, so important. Thank you once again for your wonderful address. Now I, invite the Honorable Defense Minister. This is Krishna Mothiariji to welcome, welcome to address us. Um, she has stood for transparency, for participation, for uh, responsibility. And uh, today we would, it is wonderful to have you with us and we'd like to hear from you now. Over to you. You'll have to unmute yourself, madam. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Excellencies, honorable speakers, distinguished participants. My warm greetings and best wishes from Paramaribo, Suriname to all speakers and attendees of this conference. I also express my sincere appreciation to the World Forum for Ethics in Business and the Art of Living Foundation for hosting this conference on the occasion of World Health Day. It is truly an honor and privilege for me to be invited to participate in this important conference to share my thoughts on an even more important and contemporary topic, how we as global community can recover from the devastating impact the COVID pandemic has. How can we be better prepared for the future? This brings me to the topic of my speech, the role of mental resilience in governance and how can we empower women to cope with the COVID-19 pandemic. It is without a doubt that every person directly or indirectly has been affected by the coronavirus. It is affecting societies and economies in so many ways. In my country, Suriname, we are dealing with three crises at the same time. One is the COVID crisis. Second is a huge financial crisis characterized by an inflation of almost 50%. And the third is a lack of trust in politicians due to high levels of corruption in the recent past. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that we as nation will overcome this situation with a strong willpower and dedication. I'm grateful to be appointed as Minister of Defense and to have the opportunity to contributing to peace and security in Suriname and helping assure the well being of our people. History shows us that having success and happiness is not the result of the absence of problems, 
but it is due to the tremendous potential, the ability and intelligence to cope with the most difficult and life-threatening situation. It is overcoming problems. A strong mind is the most indispensable in the beginning of the journey in which the will to change, a strong desire along with the right direction, dedication and discipline are essential parts. Without a sound mind, no vision will ever materialize. The history of mankind is filled with great strong minds of men and women who have proven that even without many resources, they were able to impact greatly and shape the world we live in today. The founder, Sri Sri Gurudev Sri Sri, is a living example of a leader who has impacted tens of thousands and connecting people through all levels of society and bringing leaders together to achieve astounding results, breaking barriers of diversity and connecting people. His mission of a stress-free and violence-free society is carried out by sharing knowledge, teaching skills, breathing techniques, and promoting an attitude of sharing, caring, and spreading love. Today, COVID-19 has affected every country in more ways than we could have anticipated. I want to emphasize that it is important to recognize that, go, that COVID goes far beyond just the health issue. The social and, ec and economic implications are so immense that we are speaking of the new normal. None of us had expected this change a year ago, but this change has announced itself through an enem enemy invisible to the beer eye. I believe that we have to address the following for the future, the following four major challenges for the future. Dealing with change in so many areas that it increases levels of stress and will impact the health of a lot of people. Dealing with social isolation. We are social beings not used to live isolated and now we are expected to stay home and avoid social gatherings. This is a total shift. Three, the rede redefining the importance of values, such as individual freedom versus restrictions for general, general interest, keeping businesses open or closed, public health versus economic benefits. We face dilemmas, difficult and hard choices for government leaders. Principles of good governance, such as transparency, accountability, and participation are all under pressure. There is also a declining trust of the public and government leaders. And the fourth challenge is the increasing poverty and inequality. The inclusion of minority groups require appropriate measure to ensure that everyone is taken care of. All these four major challenges require mental resilience, mental resilience at every level of the society, but even more in government, governance. Strong leadership showing high levels of integrity, fairness and openness can lead the community to hard and tough times. A strong mind is inherently part of this kind of leadership. Leadership that accepts responsibility and holds themselves, hold themselves accountable a mindset that is calm, able to absorb, rearrange, translate, and produce specific solutions to demanding situations. Leaders who recognize the importance of mental resilience. I have served 38 years in law enforcement, fulfilling several leadership positions, including, including that of police commissioner. Based on this experience, I acknowledge the importance of remaining calm in the most chaotic situations, the importance of avoiding panic. Mental strength is part of all training programs of police and military courses. And I think that it should be part of the education program of every government. A strong mindset is also found to be characteristic of every successful person, individuals with a strong focus and with the ability to keep, in, keep moving forward, aware of their strengths and weaknesses, but focused on the goal. They understand that struggle will be part of the road, but success is also evident 
when we, when we are determined and willing to work towards it. Referencing WHO, Dr. Friedley's report on mental health of 2009, where she wrote, mental health is fundamental element of resilience, health assets, capabilities, and positive adaption that enable people to cope, to flourish, and to experience good health and social outcomes. Improving mental health brings significant benefits for health and quality of life for individuals and for communities. Therefore, governments should implement policies and programs to support positive mental health for the whole population. Even in this COVID pandemic where daily people are dealing with changes, isolation, and tremendous stress, the importance of mental resilience is ignored. This has to be changed. Mental resilience must have the highest priority within all government policies. Leaders and institutions with high doses of mental resilience will influence and consequently win the trust of citizens. Government's responsiveness and ability to deliver and address the needs of the people will contribute to building this trust. A strong, resilient mind provides the opportunity to build the competence needed to have the actions of our leaders speaks louder than words. And now the question, what can we do as society, as women leaders, for women, for women facing new challenges in the COVID pandemic? Is it possible to stay calm, be happy, and successful even in this pandemic? I believe the answer is yes, because mental toughness, emphasizing and honing strengths, and fostering strong relationships are core. I even dare to say natural competences of women. Even with the impact of COVID-19, women of all walks of life showed strength by adjusting their usual or natural way of living, by being more creative and more aware. They care for children at home because schools are closed. Many of us combine this with a job while juggling and sometimes also coping with the stress of everything that comes with a household and a career with still maintaining our calmness. And even as incomes decreases, fewer job opportunities are available and supply and storage of food and basic essentials become challenging due to the lockdowns and closure of business. I witness how women with resilient minds allow, this, allow themselves to rise above the situation and to even lend a helping hand to others. As, you, as a member of the Art of Living in Suriname, it has been a blessing to have been part of various training and community service activities in my own country and abroad, where I have the privilege to work with women and men from all walks of life. Every one of those experiences has contributed to setting the foundation for my awareness of self, my environment, and the soundness of my own mindset. This was a journey of many years, and I can speak from personal experience of the valuable impact the Art of Living Network has had on my life and way of thinking, a way of dealing with crisis, both personal and in role of governance. Being part of Women's Network, where women empower women, has been an important contributor to my success. And it is therefore that I want to leave you with an encouragement to, re to remain part of and enhance your social cohesion. The contradiction is that while COVID asks us to socially dis distance ourselves, there is also the greater need in these times to nurture relationship and to continue to empower and support other women. Therefore, I leave you with this. Let's start the process of rethinking and redefining social distancing, distancing with physical distancing today. Maintaining our physical distance will contribute to protection of our health. And I encourage you to keep doing that. But that doesn't mean we can't redefine how we fulfill our social need or we can't, or we can't start with identifying ways to meet it. Our era has given us various digital means through which we can further build and harness from the networks that we as people, we as women need. And of course, learn 
and make ourselves competent. Let us once more make the world witness the resilience of the female mind and show that we women can adapt, that we can create, that we can collaborate, and that we can set a new way of success, even in times of crisis, when we decide to put our minds to it. Having a strong, having a strong mind connected with other strong minds is the tool we should master and internal, internalize for the new era. We belong to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. That was wonderful. Um, how even uh, in this time of COVID and this time of isolation, we have been able to connect to so many people all over the world today uh, is an example of how technology can help us to connect. So yes, social isolation is important to protect our health, but it is important for us to keep connecting like this via technology. And um, also how you highlighted that leadership needs to accept responsibility, be transparent, um, to be able to uh, respond to situations. And um, also how you spoke about the role of women in uh, nurturing relationships, nurturing, um, you know, uh, balancing uh, family as well as uh, professional duties. So thank you so much for your address. It was wonderful. And now it is my honor and it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Vandana Shiva, who has been with us uh, many times uh, before in many, uh, many occasions to address us. And I'd like to quote from her, one of her talks where she says, food is health. Health is continuum from soil to plants, to the food we eat, to our gut. Machines break down, but living systems regenerate and heal. So over to you Vandana ji and looking forward to your address. Thank you, Chinky. And dear, dear Bhanu Di, uh, your excellency, it's such a pleasure to be uh, on this panel with women with strong minds and strong hearts um, and strong resilience. Um, over my journey through life, beginning as a physicist, as a quantum physicist, and spending the last five decades uh, in service of the earth and service of community, um, I have learned a few lessons about the cultivation of the strong, uh, strong mind. Uh, I think the first lesson really is interconnectedness and non-separation. Your Excellency, the Defense Minister of Surinam, talked about not interpreting physical distance as social distance. Now, this becomes very difficult if you think of the world in a mechanistic way of made of things that are totally separate and they're immutable and they don't change and they're inert and it's only violence and force that can move them. But in the quantum world, action at a distance takes place because in the quantum world, the world is interconnected through potential, through energy. And as uh, Guruji constantly points out, uh, spandana, the vibrations, are the foundational reality of life, not material, immutable things and facts. So we are in a very, very beautiful universe, a very, very beautiful Earth, and our interconnectedness with life on Earth and our consciousness is, for me, a very important cultivation. For a strong mind, but it also, by its very nature, becomes a spiritual mind, and this is what Guruji teaches um, through the art of living. There's another very strong element of quantum theory, and that is uncertainty, because the mechanistic, deterministic um, paradigm created a world of deep predictability and certainty, but the world is not. And especially in periods of the kind we are living through, uncertainty is the nature of things. And uh, the Deputy Prime Minister uh, said very beautifully, um, experience of overcoming problems, that is strength. This is resilience. And because the world is not mechanical, 
we can't afford to have a mechanical mind, even though that's been the education from the West, sadly, the Cartesian and Baconian thinking, uh, the Newtonian thinking. What we need is a diversity of the mind, an ecological mind. Uh, because a rigid mind is a brittle mind. It breaks down, as Chinky said, you know, machines break down. Living systems, conscious beings evolve, adapt, respond, and change their reality. Because we are in an interconnected world and nothing is separate, what we eat is not separate from our food, our health and our being. Um, again, you know, if you look at old textbooks of health, the brain was here and then there was the body. But the gut is our second brain. And there's a brilliant book written by a colleague of mine. And we have a book called Annam, Food as Health. And I wish all of you wonderful International Health Day. The book called Mind Gut says, for decades, the mechanistic militaristic disease model set the agenda for medical research. As long as you could fix the affected mechanical part, we thought the problem would be solved. There was no need to understand its ultimate cause. We are just beginning to realize that the gut, the microbes living in it, 100 trillion of them, constitute one of the major components of these regulatory systems and the signal, signaling molecules that they produce from their vast number of genes. And Guruji has done so much to promote the knowledge of Ayurveda. And um, Ayurveda has also always said, diversity of food is vital for a strong body and a strong mind. Because as we say, as your grandmothers used to say, jesa anna vesa man, and if your anna is rotten and junk, you're going to have a very junky and a very weak mind. And uh, Emran, uh, Maya carries on and says, the multitude, they're now waking up to the fact that our spices have so much phytochemicals and a diet derived from a rich, a rich diet in diverse plants combined with the array of perfectly matching sensory mechanisms in our gut synchronizes our internal ecosystem, our gut microbiome. We have intelligent sensors in our gut. It's a more complex computer system, as is the soil. And our research in Navdanya, the movement I started with the simple act of saving seeds, has shown that the soil is more neurological activity than the World Wide Web, that one root of one plant has more neurological activity than the brain up here. And of course, our gut is called the second brain. We are so fortunate that we have such a rich tradition in, and not a tradition that's not based in science, it's just based in a different science, a holistic science, a system science, a science of interconnectedness. Whereas the mecha mechanistic science that is dominating and is creating the fear in people's minds is of broken down, fragmented, reductionist systems. And the last time I was on a webinar uh, and with Guruji, it was so beautiful because he talked about the multiple sheets, you know, that in India, we're not isolated bodies disconnected with the world. We are multiple sheets, the Anamai Kosh, where food and interacts and the Pranamaya, the energy, the Manomaya, all our senses, our five knowing senses, which Descartes said, are totally unreliable. My God, if I don't know from my smell that something's stinking, I'm going to eat bad food. If I can't hear from my ears bad sounds, I will not know the difference between noise and music. The senses are knowing systems in our epistemology. And then the Vigyana Mekosh, the ability to not just have knowledge, the ability to discriminate, the ability to know truth from untruth. And I think this again is so important in our times and I know the art of living movement 
can play a very, very big role in this. Because while we are all facing the pandemic, we are also facing a preparation of a world which is reducing this deep context of a strong mind to two worries. The first, that our human data is being mined, our brain data and our body data. And this is the subject of much debate, that we are being turned into the new raw material. And then this is taken and processed through algorithm. And you will see suddenly in the last year or two, the idea of behavior modification is everywhere. Now I am having to deal with one of the richest men in the world who is saying the only future to save the planet is fake food made in labs. But if food is making us and our mind, fake food is going to not just accelerate chronic diseases, it's going to accelerate the planetary collapse. Uh, my work in agriculture, and I've been compelled, it wasn't my chosen field, but I've written about 20 books on the subject. Uh, you know, all of the recent epidemics, including the current pandemic, ultimately are from the forests. 300 of them, Ebola, HIV, Zika, SARS, H1N1, um, the Nipah virus, all of them. You invade into the forest and you unleash these new epidemics. It comes from a particular model which doesn't know when enough is enough. It comes from a model of an economy based on greed, limitless taking from the earth. And that is why another aspect of the strong mind is to know when enough is enough, to know that you should only take what is absolutely necessary. And that's why, again, our teachings our teachings of enoughness, of simplicity, of, of detachment. You know, the issue of Upanishad is so beautiful in saying, this universe is for all, enjoy its gifts, but don't take more than your share. Enjoy your, the gifts without greed. And this therefore is the time to, in the midst of this pandemic to think about economies beyond greed, where Economies where the 1% is not controlling the entire planet. I have a book called Oneness Versus the 1% on this issue. And this course also means that we use our rich wisdom to address the narrow trajectory that has brought us to this precipice. I've just done a book with an Ayurvedic physician, Dr. Gangadharan in Bangalore, because of three patterns. You know, a lot of my life is spent on understanding the world by seeing where the patterns are going. And our patterns, you know, our neem was patented, our basmati was patented, our wheat was patented. And I said, no, but these are not your inventions. And we fought this and we reclaimed this heritage. But this new little book is, is the two futures of food, health and humanity, a civilizational dialogue linked to patterns, real patterns, real ideas of where to take us, and our brilliance of our ecological civilization. I'll give you just one example. We have huge anemia. We have a lot of iron deficiency because we're killing the green plants, the amaranth, the butler, butwa. We are not eating our full diversity of the diet. One of the patterns is put nanoparticles, 10 to the power minus nine, into our bloodstream. And every scientist tells you, you cannot assess the impact of nanoparticles that break through every protective barrier. So our civilization is being called on to address the future and shape it for the well-being of the entire planet, to shape it for the well-being of future generations, and to create a strong mind that is able to think of how we can reduce our ecological footprint, live better, increase our headprint our heart print through compassion and love, and our hand print through redefining categories that were evolved in the fossil fuel age of the fewer people there are, but the bigger fossil fuel you use, you can you have 
agriculture with 10 units of energy producing one unit of food, it's a negative economy when ecologically we can use one unit to produce 10 units of food. So the hand, head and hand print is what our civilization is based on. It's a good time to not give up what we have. It's a good time to not allow wisdom to be replaced by data. It's been called a new religion called dataism. What we need is a deep spirituality that cultivates a strong mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandana Ji. That was really as so inspiring and so wonderful to hear you. And for uh, thank you so much for reminding us once again how our traditions, our scriptures can be the roadmap to the future, can be uh, the way forward for us to come out of this pandemic in a healthy and in a more, uh, with a stronger mind. Thank you so much. And also you talked about Ayurveda, the importance of Ayurveda, the importance of Spandana, the vibrations that we are all connected, our universe is connected, what we think, what we feel uh, can impact all the people around us. So thank you, thank you so much Vandana Ji for, uh, for your wonderful uh, thoughts on this particular subject. So um, all of you have shared with us the different ways forward uh, the vice prime minister said that how we should have holistic education, a values-based education, children not to be taught by rote learning, by for them to understand more. And uh, the defense minister shared with us how processes have to be in place, how uh, so many uh, um, the Art of Living programs have done so much in Suriname uh, for the community, for the society. And also how Bhanu Didi shared that how we need to uh, pay attention to our mind uh, with spiritual practices. And of course, how Vandana Ji, you shared, how the food we eat impacts our mind, impacts our, you know, that the gut is our second brain and that we need to pay attention to it. But all these ideas and all these wonderful collective intentions that we have all shared today, when they are complemented with practical tools, then we can integrate it into our life better. And what other better way is there through meditation, through silence, through the calm and very um, balanced uh, mind can these, these intentions that we have all come forward with can be sown. The seeds of those intentions can be sown. So I will now request Bhanu Didi to lead us into a meditation where all your collective intentions can manifest. Please Didi, over to you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> After such wonderful, uh, you know, knowledge session, it is nice to be taking it in through silence by meditating. It was so wonderful, Vandana Ji, once again. We thank you so much again and again. You come and enlighten us and give us so much strength. Uh, how we have to depend on. Uh, in our roots, isn't it? It's so important to be proud of our roots and wisdom is our uh, necessary and not the dat dataism. <laughs> that was very nice. <laughs> and, uh, and all the excellencies and it's so wonderful to be with all of you. Let's meditate now for uh, 10 minutes, yeah? Let's sit comfortably and easily. Spine erect, shoulders loose, neck loose, and the whole body relaxed. Smile on your face, eyes closed. Let's take normal deep breath in. And breathe out, relax your whole body. Keep breathing normal, deep, gentle breath. Your incoming breath energizes the body and your outgoing breath relaxes the body. Breathe in with a smile and breathe out with a smile.
Once again, breathe in. And as you breathe out, relax your whole body. Relax your shoulders, relax your neck. Relax your face and relax your whole body. Become aware of the noises around you, if any. And accept all the noises. Be with it. Once again, breathe in and breathe out. Relax your whole body. Become aware of your body. This body is a beautiful gift to you from nature, from divine. Honor your own body. Once again, breathe in. And as you breathe out, relax your body more and more. Become aware of your thoughts. Good thoughts, bad thoughts, let it be. Once again, breathe in and breathe out. Become aware of your feelings. Pleasant, unpleasant, let it be. You're much more bigger than your thoughts and feelings. Once again, breathe in and breathe out. Relax more and more. You are peace, you are joy.
Take a deep breath in and breathe out. Once again, breathe in and breathe out. Become aware of your body and surroundings. Once again, breathe in. And as you breathe out, very slowly and gradually, take your own time, very slowly and gradually, you may open your eyes with a smile. Thank you. We have to thank you, Bhanuvidhi, for this wonderful experience and, and showing us the practical uh, way of uh, reaching into ourselves, into the, the silence and the depth of our being through meditation. So thank you so much, Bhanuvidhi. So we have come to the end of our session here. Before that, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for being with us and enlightening us and sharing with us um, about the way forward and how we can move out of this uh, crisis with hope and enthusiasm. And also a common thread that went through all of your talks was how uh, we can go back. We can go back to our tradition, go back to our, the knowledge of our ancient uh, scriptures to give us the strength of mind to move forward, you know? So it was really wonderful to be with you and be a part of this panel today. And uh, we hope we can connect uh, in the future for other forums and other conferences. Um, I thank all our distinguished speakers. I thank all those who have joined from all over the world to be a part of this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for being with us and participating. I thank, I thank the World Forum for Ethics and Business, the team, the organizing committee, and all their members for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. Namaste.